On this episode, I can't believe I'm saying this after the spring we had, but we could use some rain to fill out the grain. We continue the discussion on late season diseases in the field, and we are exposing the secret on how seed companies always win their test plots. Listen in to see how. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Welcome to Cup of Joe, Season 2, Episode 2. Today we have our regulars, Tommy, Turk, and Ben, and we're going to give you the update on uh, what happened this past week here. Let's start with Turk. A little bit of the same old, same old, Joe. Uh, need a rain, dry in a lot of areas, uh, pollination is uh, uh, being affected. I'm sure we're getting some ear tipping coming back on a lot of these areas that are dry. Uh, it seems like the areas down south are getting some rain, but we should sure could use the rain across uh, Iowa. Eastern Iowa is East, really Eastern really Iowa. Wet I, or I dry. did I did notice the drought index expanded to a lot bigger area than my little my little section where I live. Right. Now it's a, uh, quite a bit bigger area, several counties. So that drought index is starting to get bigger and bigger. But uh, could use a rain. Um, the bean a lot of corn uh, is, is to the point where it's just about past uh, pollination, but could still still help a lot on that kernel fill, wouldn't it, Ben? Yep. So on the uh, Skip had some ears in that he had brought in. So it looks like some of the earlier season stuff, um, the 108 day stuff, was tipped back about that far. And the fuller season stuff well, hadn't been tipped back. So there might have been a couple days there during pollination that tipped back was, was pretty hard. Um, but I mean, for the most part, for no better than the, the soil type that our, our plot is on. I mean, stuff looks fairly good, so I'm, I'm excited to see what we, we get there, but, you know, hopefully this afternoon I'll get to get out and look at a lot more cornfields and see where we're at. Beans are podding uh, heavy now, and uh, again, we're to the point where uh, rain's getting to, getting to a critical time on the bean fields as well. we got a little bit more time here on the beans yet, but uh, um, they're going to need a rain. The markets are reacting a little bit uh, to, the, to the weather forecast. Uh, now and uh, but it sure isn't reacting anything to do anything with uh, the settlement of the trade uh, war. It it just keeps ratcheting up a little bit more and more all the time. Well, we lost China. It sounds like, but there was some. They did purchase a little bit before they put before they uh, decided not to buy any more. They'll be us. back soon enough. They, they, they again. It, it they're, everybody's posturing for position, and and I think it will get settled at some point, but. Who knows how long that's going to be? And it won't be a problem putting those tariffs on if they're not buying beans from mm -hmm. us. So, Tommy, I mean, you said that um, they did something with the disaster in Illinois. Yeah, yeah. on Thursday, I believe it was all of counties in the state of Illinois have been considered disaster counties. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's wow. juice from flooding from the north of the state all the way to the south, obviously, and then now there's the, dr the drought indexes. Uh, pretty much across the whole state too as well. But um, additional, I have actually right now, low interest FSA emergency loans may be used to restore, replace essential property, cover production costs, and pay essential family living costs. So things are, you know, all year long, they've been pretty rough in Illinois and, and across the Midwest. I mean, yep. there's lots of places. Lots, but, of, uh, lots of areas. Is there a new a new report coming out the 12th? Yes. Okay. Yep, that's uh, the updated uh, Better be back uh, acreage. Last one, right? acreage. Yep, that'll, yeah. that'll be the... the long-awaited um, uh, report that supposedly gives us our final preventive planning numbers and planted acres and, and all of that. So everybody's got their number and speculating, but, you know, I, hadn't, I haven't seen any other numbers. Yeah. So a lot of variability out there, right? Yeah. Up and downs. How about you, Ben? Well, I just, I'm kind of with Turk on the same old, same old. Haven't got to spend much time out in the field to, to see any real differences. I know that there's more and more disease that's showing up. Um, Illinois, the University of Illinois was talking about how they're getting, they're, they're seeing more tar spots show up in northwest Illinois, I believe. They had like eight counties that were confirmed, and they believe it's going to be quite a few more counties show up as pollination continues on through. Um, what is tar spot? Tar spot is a it's a new disease that uh, we saw. Basically, runs up and down the Mississippi River. It's a black uh, speck that forms on leaves and corn. Uh, defoliates corn pretty quickly once they get through, you know, kernel fill and that kind of things. Uh, I believe it overwinters in the soil. I haven't uh, read a lot about it, but it seems to affect. It, it, it's going to work its way from 
the counties that touch the Mississippi River out, so and it's working its way south. So it's a detrimental disease, but the the widespread index of it hasn't it hasn't affected a lot of people yet. Let's put it that way. Fungicide applications help? They don't know yet. Oh yeah. They're they're still working on that. Okay. Have you seen any stem canker or sudden death? Yeah. <laughs> I am. I spent quite a few quite a few hours this morning on the phone with different growers talking about stem canker um, and phytophthora both um, yeah. with with the moisture that we've had sure. it's it seems like especially down south with the moisture that we have it, it's prevalent for both of those diseases and and things are progressing through the year and and there, we're probably going to see more and more of it show up yeah. so uh, stem canker is one of those ones that can be <coughs> reduced by certain fungicides like I've said four or five times on Cup of Joe. Try to use the stuff that's got three modes of action. The The labels don't say anything on stem canker, but the universities say that it has, fungicides do have a certain amount of suppression. Do you have any keep the beans healthy. name brands? I mean, as far as which ones that would be good for them? I, I, I can give you an example. I mean, Moravis Neo is a triple stack. Um, Tribe Pro is a triple stack. There are other, there, I think there's one more triple stack product out there that okay. I can't name off the top of my head, but we don't endorse things. We just I understand. regurgitate information that the universities tell us. So Absolutely. the universities say, seem to have a lot of value in that triple stack fungicide. So, so anything else uh, from the disease standpoint or something that should be watched out? How about spider mites and, uh, and sudden death, has that changed much since last week? I think that we're going to see sudden death start to show up in about a week and a half. With the inch up, and give or take an inch of rain that we had, I believe that we're going to start seeing those that, that stuff show up. And that's about typical middle of August, mm -hmm. third week in August yeah. is when we usually see that disease rear its ugly head. I think another rain that we get is really going to uh, increase the, the disease severity. Speaking of sudden death, uh, the update that we just received uh, a couple days ago on uh, Sultro, the, you know, the new competitive product to Olivo, is that uh, they have strong feelings that uh, middle of next week they might get the federal label. That's what they're saying. So that, so it's could potentially easily be available before spring, and so we'll keep an eye on that in the next Cup of Joe episode if it does get the. Uh, Approval will sure pass that on. Saltro is a, a brand new uh, product, a fungicide seed treatment that will give uh, good uh, control of sudden death uh, and then also nematodes mm -hmm. and is uh, has uh, less uh, uh, autotoxicity to the soybean seed coming out of the ground. So yep. no, no halo effect, is, I guess you might say. Phytotoxicity. Phytotoxicity, yep. I said the wrong So it would be, be sunlight, autotoxicity yep. so the bit with That's alpha. right. Thank you for You're close. Yeah. Well, I got the toxicity part. Right? <laughs> right. That's why we got you, Ben. Yeah. I do my best. I want to talk to you about why is it that a company that runs a test plot always wins the test plot compared to one or two competitors? Well, is the data rigged? No. It all has to do with probability. And I'm going to put up a, a slide here on, on, on uh, this uh, discussion so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. If you have a, a product, let's say it's a Mersman product, and we're comparing to a competitor, X, Y, and Z, and they have equal yield. All indications are they're equal yield. Well, if we put our one product against the three competitor products, then we have a 25% chance of winning. If our product is two bushel better than the competitors, and there's three competitors against us, again, even having a two bushel advantage, we still only move up 37% chance of winning. If we have a product that's four bushel better compared to three competitor products, we only have a 51% chance of winning. So many times when you do side-by-sides <coughs> and when you do uh, in test plots, the odds are that you're not going to see the, the actual yield advantage that, a customer, that an individual product has. And when it comes to corn, there's another factor that plays in. And Ben, tell us about that. Well, when it comes to corn, and we've talked about it just a little bit, I think, in the past, when it comes to corn, the, the height difference on, on your corn can have major effect on, we, we call it a shading effect, on the, the shorter varieties. And that's why with a lot of other companies, they've been, over the years, they've been uh, selecting for tall plants because the taller plants always win their, their side-by-sides or their, their, their plot data. So 
the shading effect, uh, the university, I don't remember which university that uh, Warren Stein was talking about, but they believe that every inch that you have can potentially be a bushel lost. Every inch taller that variety is, your competitor variety is, the shorter variety is going to be a, uh, an inch off. And he, their data doesn't necessarily correlate with that. I mean, mm -hmm. they've seen stuff that's higher, or shading effect can have worse <coughs> value and shading effect can have better value than that. So it's it's kind of an ambiguous, we're not real sure where that number's at, but I know for a fact that our competitors, when we do side-by-sides or we're in plots against yeah. our competitors, they try to stick the tallest thing next to our shortest thing and talk about how, Much well, this product, the science yeah. stuff doesn't yield. No, it's because it's collecting less sunlight because it's getting shaded out in the morning and in the evening, it doesn't see near as much time to taking in energy. And what are corn plants and bean plants? They're essentially solar panels that make green. Right. So how far from a tall hybrid is that shading effect? How far do you feel that goes? How many feet? I think it's something like either an inch or two is like 30 feet. Most corn plots are put in by eight or 12 row planters. So you're shading that entire that entire uh, width. width of the of the eight to twelve row that that you're you're planted in. So the short guy really is never has a chance, does he? No, nope. you're 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 starting from you're starting at a negative. You're never starting even keel. Okay, except if there's wind. Then, then except if there's wind, and then we got we a got a little advantage. advantage. Yeah. The only thing that would affect that the, at that point then would be a pollination, a difference in pollination date and the weather with that. How did they pollinate? That's the only thing that would affect it. If you're doing those side by sides, that shading effect has a bigger effect if if everything's equal on pollination. Correct. Well, the bottom line is when you look at plot data, you better be looking at plant height and then location of the corn hybrid in the plot. And the same thing when you look at soybeans, if you're looking at something that has a zero or two or four bushel yield, you know, how many varieties were against it and what the probability is. I know you watch your yield monitor. Does it stay exactly even as you go across the field? There's up and down, up and down. And this is what this all has to do. It has to do with probability. So when your Mershman rep comes out there and makes a recommendation, and the recommendation is based on many, many locations, many years of data in research, we are making a better recommendation than just going down and looking at a test plot that is done locally, in my opinion. So when picking soybean varieties, and I know one of the things that really irritated me last year was, you know, seeing the, some of the information out that extend soybeans yield over five bushel better than Liberty Link soybeans. And looking at that information and, and applying this against it makes it absolutely unbelievable in my opinion and where did we get this information we got it from Monsanto in fact it was given to me back in 2010 uh, and so we have a, a video link it's 14 minute long video I encourage you to take a little bit of time to watch it so after cup of Joe take a look at the video it explains the science and probability uh, and statistical significance of, of these differences in yield and what you can actually measure and what you can't measure so sometimes the best soybean or the best corn hybrid doesn't get planted on the farmer's farm because of the statistical differences that they are perceiving as, as yield advantage. And it really isn't a yield advantage there. No. So that's a big thing. You know, uh, we wanted to kind of educate you on that. You can make your own conclusions and make your own decisions. But if you have a little bit of more of the facts about how this is all works and how it plays, and, and we know of at least two companies in the corn business when they put a competitor in, they make sure the short is against the, their taller hybrids. They want the short one against their taller hybrids, so they stack the odds in their favor. Warren was telling us how you know a Stein average typically is at like a hundred and eight inches or something like that, and that's measured to the top of the leaf, not yep. to the top of the tassa. Correct. Top the top leaf. Yep, so we're running at 108 inches, give or take, for our average. And the two other major corn brands that we sell a lot against, one of them's average is like 117, and the other one's average is like 100 and, uh, 122 or something like that. So we are statistically shorter, and we have advantages, but we just can't see those advantages when we're constantly shaded out. So the side-by-side -side thing is something that we really try to stay away from. You know, plant half the field, plant the other half the field. Take your data from that. Yeah, and then basically move out at least 40 feet and then take your checks, but right against each other, four rows against four rows, odds are you're going to lose every time if you got a Stein hybrid. Correct. Every, every time. Every time. Unless there's wind. <laughs> if there's wind, we'll be the only one standing. And, uh, That's true. And, and uh, we'll win that way. But 
these are just some things you know right now um, you know the seed prices are out for all the seed companies now they're all posturing they're all you're going to get at least six messages because that's the statistical average that six seed companies call on every farmer to try to sell them seed and you're going to hear be bombarded with information yield data and you'll be just a little bit smarter because you know the statistical advantages and what what this all involves but the bottom line is what when we come to market with a new product it is the very very best product that we can come with it's based on management that has been breeding soybeans for 51 years from ms technologies uh, and that's because the same the same folks that have been in a breeding program for 51 years are managing the ms technologies program so we're going to bring you good solid soybean varieties and uh, things that you can hang your hat on for yield well, Ben, what is the value of a local test plot? Well, the value of the test plot is to get out and, and look at how that variety handles stress, you know, the disease tolerances that that individual variety may have, um, the height differences. You know, we get a lot of information and value on putting uh, like a workhorse style soybean that handles stress well and on black dirt. I mean, we get heights, we get all, all sorts Merchants. of information, but the yield is really the least important thing that we look at in in those situations because there's so much variability across the, the field. Right. It has more to do with like a big construct rather than dialing in and trying to figure out the actual yield on that individual so, spot. So you get to kind of look at the architecture of the plant and, and see if it fits your, your planting style, if you're wide rows, narrow rows, things like that. If it's bushy or, yep. or not, mm -hmm. or not, how bushy a plant is it? So. Yep. Yeah, and we've always, we tell our salespeople all the time, the last thing we should do is take a way wagon to a test plot because we're really not doing the farmer any real justice by showing him the yields because of the statistical variance in height and all the other things that go into uh, determining yield. And even that farmer that has his, his yield monitor and is looking and trying to make decisions based on that side-by-side -side comparison with that yield monitor because, again, it's the same thing. It's going to measure the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you really need to get out away from the other varieties and do large acres to have any validity to how that one's going to perform. Because there can be, what, 20% 20, 20 difference across the plot with the very same variety. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've always heard on corn, and I've seen it published by Pioneer, that there's got to be at least about a 35 bushel uh, advantage. In other words, you get, your hybrid's got to win by 35 bushel before there's a statistical probability that, that not of 90% that it's going to happen again next year. So, in essence, there's not too many corn hybrids out there a 35 bushel better than right. another corn hybrid. So, uh, we do a lot of work and make a lot of decisions based on data that may not be 100% the right way to make a decision. So, it's something to think about. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about this in the future, I'm sure. Absolutely. And definitely this fall when we see how the yields are. Anyhow, uh, thanks for watching today. And as always, we sincerely appreciate your business. And we'll see you next week. Bye.